So our next session, I'm hoping that we're all going to feel a little bit uncomfortable, to be honest, because I feel I want to feel like we're eavesdropping on a conversation. Um, the way we set this up was uh, we invited two uh, music officers to have a conversation with each other about what they do, about some of their achievements, some of their challenges. And I know that these two um, spend some time on the phone talking to each other and tapping into um, their, each other's knowledge. So uh, that's the feel I'm looking for, Kate and Corey. We have uh, Kate Becker, the director of the Seattle Office of Film and Music. And Kate is just such an inspirational leader in our field. Um, she's, she's known the world over, uh, and the work of Seattle is known the world over, and we, um, I think we all copy it with abandon, so, so we love Seattle. Um, and Corey Crossman, who is the Music Industry Development Officer from London, Ontario, where they only just created the position a couple of years ago, and really in such a short time, Corey has accomplished a great deal, and many of uh, other Canadian cities are watching uh, Corey with with admiration and awe. So today they're going to uh, have an in-depth uh, interview with each other up here on the stage. And as I said, we're all going to feel just a tiny bit uncomfortable, like we're uh, sitting in on a private convo. But that's the way we like it. So come on up, Kate and Mark. Um, 
It's just so fantastic. In fact, uh, one of the people who helped start it is here in the room with me today, Tom Warren, the executive director of KEXP, who was a music commissioner at the same time I was. And uh, we wanted to make sure that young people had access to our industry. And so we picked up this idea to have City of Music Career Day. And as I mentioned, it's now happened seven years in a row. And we're expanding to do Film Career Day. We did Visual Arts Career Day and Literary Career Day. So it's sort of trending in Seattle now to expand further. And um, yeah, it's really great. Industry professionals come out like mad on this day to donate their time and really help the next generation of music industry professionals learn what the opportunities are in Seattle. Well beyond being concert producers and promoters, which we both were, but all the other opportunities that are in the industry really get sort of spelled out and shared. And I think that's an important piece, right, is, and we sort of will talk about how we got to this role, you know, working for the government. Uh, definitely not something I ever thought that I would be doing. Um, all right. <laughs> but it's an interesting way that we sort of found ourselves here, right? Stumbled into it, if you will, kind of thing. Um, but I think, you know, that sort of talks a lot about the all-age stuff. You know, you've done some really cool work around safety as well. Um, and Seattle's an incredible music scene, right? If you think of Seattle right away, instant images and artists come to mind. Um, but I think in recent years, you know, there's been a sort of new movement, a new scene that's kind of come over there, right? We're talking about EDM. Um, and I, I know you had, we've talked about that too, you've had some challenges, right, with uh, some of the festivals, and so you've really sort of adapted a safety plan, right? looking at security. Um, I'll, I'll just be really interested in that. I think it's been a neat initial thing. It's true, we did have some challenges in our EDM scene, our electronic dance music scene, which is huge in Seattle, it's throughout our clubs, but we also have great big festivals. And um, there were some issues around drug usage, specifically Molly and young people dying, and um, a couple of young people, not a lot of young people, but a couple of young people, enough to cause the um, largest EDM promoter to come to me and say, I can't have kids dying on my watch, what are we going to do, I need your help. And that's when we pulled together all the people working in that scene, from the medics to the police officers to the, the promoters themselves, to really start having some honest conversation about what was happening. And, and that's really a, a model for what we do overall. When we have an issue, we move towards it, and we bring the people who are a part of it to the table to have some honest conversation about how we can shift things. And that, and that kind of goes back to like your focus, like you've got this 10-year this plan, right? Um, Sorry, the, what's the, the vision, 10-year vision? It's called the City of Music Vision, yeah. 2020. So it's similar to um, what, what we've created, one music strategy, right? where it's got priorities. Ours didn't have a timeline. I like to give a timeline. <laughs> um, when I you know, took on this role, that was one of the first things I saw is that we that was 12 priorities, but like one of the most important pieces was missing. And we had nothing focused on export. And so it was all about you know, beating, beating the drum at home and building a sound and, and a buzz around home, but it's like, that only catches so far, and a big piece of it is the import export thing too. Uh, do you guys, did you guys dig into any of that kind of stuff when you have, like I think it's the album, I guess there's so many incredible uh, artists that from Seattle. You know, there's such a brand and sound. Um, you know, you go all the way back to Hendrix, you know, to, to Grunge Air, and now you have guys like Macklemore, and you have these amazing advocates uh, for the music industry. So, um, was that import export stuff ever sort of discussed? You know, it's, it's not at the heart of our city of music vision, to tell you the truth, and I think that in Canada you're much better about your export strategies than we are in America, but of course it's important to us, and we're always wanting our musicians to be able to get their music out into the world, and yes, we have some musicians who are great champions of yeah. Seattle. Yeah, and, and, and the international brands, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's sort of a big piece, too. Um, you know, in success that you have with this, it's a lot about like communication. I think. Mm -hmm. And I always sort of really try to emphasize that that communicating and connecting with your audience, speaking to your to your audience at the level that you've spoken to, kind of thing. Um, and I get, I've learned a lot of that through you and Don. And I've certainly learned a lot through through you as well. That stuff talking about um, like the language that you need to speak and when you're talking to bureaucrats, right? Like it's a totally different language um, and a totally different set of rules that they're working off of. Um, but I think you've been you've been great in, in showing me sort of a bit about that, like how to how to navigate that, how to find those champions sort of internally. And um, I know we've talked a little bit about social media and you know, websites and stuff like that. Um, 
it's an area that you, it's so important to have communication. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so um, you, you guys have a strong brand. And uh, how did you go? Is that part of the, the tenure well, vision? Truth be told, that it's important to have a name. One day, my predecessor just decided we would be called the City of Music. And he ran with it and created a brand. He was working with lots of industry professionals at the time, um, including myself. And, uh, you know, we later found out that New Orleans also calls themselves the City of Music. <laughs> but it is important to have a brand, something that people can hang their hat on. Our New York strategy is, that, is based on three primary tenets, that we will be a city of musicians, a city of live music, and a city of music business. So that's where our three primary are with that. And so, what, what, what's new with you? What's some of the new stuff that's going on? So, a uh, couple of things. We have a great big new music festival that is in just two weeks, and uh, I have the great honor of curating a stage there to celebrate 25 years of all ages shows. Um, we have a severe affordability and homelessness crisis going on in Seattle, and I'm honored to tell you that Pearl Jam has stepped up to the plate to help with this. They are a Seattle band, and they came out of the gate a few months ago saying, all right, we're going to do our part here and uh, help raise $10 million towards homelessness. And uh, they're doing a couple of shows in August to contribute towards that. And it's just fantastic to have musicians that care so deeply about our city. And I've got to tell you about communication piece, right? Like, this is communicating a, a message and uh, an issue that's happening, right? So it's kind of back to that safety and security piece of the Drawing on this, cool to see, you know, an, an artist to, to play like that. You know, like yeah. Further, what you're, I think you're seeing a thousandth show. Um, what what a neat way to, you know, to, to hit one thousand, right? Like, Absolutely. Like a massive impact. Yeah, they are just great, great guys. So let's talk about you, Corey. Okay. How's the rock and roll revitalization of London going? I like that. You know, I like that you say that because um, <laughs> I think that's you know what I what I call this. This work is rock and roll revitalization, and uh, you can revitalize your core, you can do all kinds of stuff through music. Um, and so, when we started like the music strategy, the concept was really was a starting point. And cultural industries, but really, they're all built around music. And so, it was an interesting conversation. Some of the first media things that I had done, you know, I'm sitting talking to news radio, and they're saying, you know, Why are you supporting music? Why music? And I said, Well, let's take it back 20 years. Why are you supporting? Uh, sports tourism and 20 years ago people thought it was crazy to you know support put money behind sports tourism now you go to a hotel any weekend in the winter you know it's booked up with a hockey team and, and all the kids and the family and stuff like that um now we're seeing that with music right so it took 20 years for people to really sort of understand that so i think it's been a little bit quicker we've got a little more traction with music right away uh, i can really speak to everybody um, but I think a big focus has been that uh, tourism is a piece of it, and you know, getting those key kind of partners involved. Uh, we have a great tourism office, um, and you know, who landed us the Junos this, uh, coming in 2019. But yeah, I think um, I think it all it all stems back to rock and roll revitalization. <laughs> you know, it's a way to move to, to turn your city around, and uh, music's a great way to connect with all the creative industries. And so I think it was a really neat starting point. Um, and we're seeing some good success with it. Excellent. Yeah, I'd say you're seeing some success. Music Contributor of the Year yeah, from Music Canada. Great. Thank you. That was unbelievable. Nominated <laughs> for Music City of the Year. Yes. yes. So it's, it's been a good, it's been a really cool year. Um, and it's just been like, an incredible team. I think it is sort of a, the one piece that I will take to push out to people is that. It takes a team uh, to really do this kind of stuff, and um, we have a strong team. You know, whether it's our culture office or our arts council or tourism or London Economic Development, um, it takes a strong team. And you know, I'm located right in the city hall, right in the thick of the bureaucracy, and it's um, it's interesting at times, definitely. Right? <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with that, but it's it's been a really cool um, journey so far. I think we've really been able to elevate uh, London's brand. Uh, as a music city, and because we're a secondary market, I think that's kind of the pieces that I want to emphasize. Because we're a secondary market, we're a little more flexible when we can get things done um, in a different way. And, and uh, 
you know, we're not traditionally viewed, I guess, as the music city, but when you really drill down on it, we really are. We have 875 students that study at post-secondary between three schools. Um, we produce incredible talent. Uh, our issue now is we're trying to obtain some of that talent and pass graduation. Um, you know, I guess you don't have to look further than uh, the engineer of the year last year at the Genos. There's three out of five London educated, uh, or sorry, three out of five of the nominees were London educated, and I don't think there's cities doing that on the regular. Right? We have amazing stuff like the Jack Richards and London Music Hall of Fame, uh, city specific Hall of Fame. I think we're the only one in Canada that has a city specific Hall of Fame. We have an incredible award show, just, you know, Jack Richards and London Music Week. Um, uh, last year, you know, it, it started. So we're doing these these things, and because we're a secondary market, um, we have these opportunities uh, to to try and test those things out. And some stuff's been around there so far. So. Excellent. Do you ever take your political leaders to your shows or events? Uh, sometimes, yeah, yeah. Some councillors have been up to some things with um, the mayor. Definitely, he's, he's, Matt's been a big advocate of, of what we're doing. And, uh, spend a, a significant amount of time with us at, at Juno's. He, he gets it. He really gets it. So having those, you know, politicians understand the importance of it uh, and how it's city building um, it is a critical piece. Um, you know, I think back to a major festival we just had, um, and you know, seeing some councillors understanding what's going on and, and taking it in. You know, you sort of see that the lights go off, kind of like, wow. Okay, yeah, this is significant economic impact. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, for everyone in those capacities. Like, we were sitting in, in, in council uh, last summer, and there was a festival that was applying for an extension uh, to do one more day of program. They're going from four to five days. And one of the councillors um, you know, pushes back and says, you know, I don't know if we, we need to do this. This, this festival, yes, everyone's talking about bringing in millions of dollars. Well, if they want this extra day, they can pay, because think of how many millions of dollars it's and I hear that, and I'm like, oh, I have no concept of, you know, what it takes to cost, the time, the energy to put a festival on. And no, they're not making millions of dollars. You know, there's dollars in, dollars out kind of thing. So you hear something like that, and then it's like, okay, I need to follow up. <laughs> we need to talk, because no, it's not how it works, right? And creating that understanding of that we need to open the gates up. We need to... Uh, create opportunity, and that's what a big, again, back to communication, a big piece of this role is um, educating, right? is really sort of educating. And, and counselors, um, you know, they see the dollars, they don't see the work necessarily that goes into it, so when you can find advocates, it's, it's, it's nice, and it definitely helps move things forward. Yeah. How did your live music census play into getting the support of the city? That was a key piece, and I think, um, you know, it talks a little bit about some of the work that you did. This, what, what we had done wasn't as focused on economics. And so I think that's really when your piece was very focused on economics when you were study. Um, being the city and you know, work, working for the man, it was, um, it's difficult to get trust with venues, right? And they won't often submit, you know, accurate information and they give you financial details and I completely understand that. So it was very tough for us to make that case economically. Right? We could drill down and find things out that we had 4,620 live music events in 2015. Um, we had 52 live music venues, so we can get some of those high level things. Um, and my boss always says that it's, you know, when you get a number like that, 4,620, a lot goes into that number. And when it looks that smooth and easy, a lot goes into it. <laughs> and, but, you know, so yours was very focused on economic impact, and that's sort of what you helped build and grow your office. That is what launched the office, was launch of it. Yeah. it was uh, the first economic impact study of the music industry in Seattle revealed that the industry was far larger than people realized. And so we had a long-standing office of film that then transitioned to be the office of film and music following that study. We're doing a new one now. We're not doing an economic impact study. We're doing an ecosystem study. More it's like true. your, yeah. more like your census than a classic economic development. And it's, study. it's a nice starting point because I think it really sort of helped build all those assets and get an understanding of, of the makeup of it, right? And that's how I can point to things like we have 875 students and, and growing. Um, it, it, it's a key piece, but I think our next piece is now building that economic uh, impact study. And because um, when you start putting dollars and cents to things. You know, it shifts other people's mindset, right? 
and I got a lot of feedback. Like we did a lot of work with uh, capturing metrics from from attendees and people that are supporting um, that are supporting the music industry and actually going out to shows. That was a key piece in what we what we did with the music census. We wanted to know what they were doing, where they were going, how they were finding out about music, um, and we, we pulled a lot of interesting metrics from that. Yeah. Is that what inspired your live music deeper work, your live music venue deeper work? Yeah, you know, from there it's, it's understanding that, I, I go back to like education and communication, like the two biggest pieces with this role, um, and I think I've learned that more so, you know, being in the job now. Um, it, it's really sort of educating your audience, right? And it goes to creating advocacy, and we've had, um, you know, we've had a challenge in, in London for, for many years now around our patios. I know when <laughs> when we were in Austin, it was, I wasn't watching bands, I was watching patios. True. <laughs> and we've been able to move past that. We actually can now have dancing and amplified entertainment on patios. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, and that was two and a half years of work to get there. It was an incredible amount of work, and but it was done through education, right? And it was connecting with the audience, doing surveys and stuff like that, and saying. Know, how many of your venues have patios? And it was like one third of our venues have patios, and all of a sudden, one third of our venues can't present music come the summer because their audience is all on the patio. And it's going, you know, if we had had that economic piece, I think it maybe would have shown a year. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, it's a key piece sort of leveraging um, your assets that you have and your audience to tell the story. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. How big is your office? An office of one. Yeah. Yeah. Office of one. Yeah. I have, I mean, I, uh, we have partners, external partners that we work with, but when it comes down to the London Music Office, it's just a, a cubicle <laughs> in City Hall on the 11th floor. It's a nice view, though. Yeah. So, so I'll be up sometime. <laughs> Great. Uh, do you have an advisory board that you work with on a regular basis? Absolutely, place? yeah. Um, so we started, we did things a little bit differently. I know you, you have a board as well. commission. Commission, that's it, yeah. Uh, we did things a little bit differently. Um, we started with like, four task teams. They were very specifically focused. Actually, we have one of the leaders from the musicians task team here, and he's done some incredible stuff. Um, we started with specific targets and worked on those sort of task teams, and then developed the London Business and Music Committee. Um, so it was a bit backwards and different than some of what other people have done, um, but I think it worked out quite nicely because it sort of showed us who some of those leaders were going to be, and it wasn't just about appointing people from this, you know, this organization and this organization. It was about where some of the people are really good at, you know, buckle down and get some of this work done. And so it was an interesting way of doing it. And it was definitely backwards from what a lot of other people have done. But I thought, it was, I thought that was an important way to handle it. Um, and now in, in Seattle, in a major market like yourself, you've got a ton of key players right on, on your commission. We do. We have a 21 person commission, half of whom are appointed by the mayor and the other half by our city council. We have nine working musicians, we have lots of industry leaders, so, and we really try to expand the um, whole breadth of education to large music industry professionals. And attract everyone, and I think some of the neat stuff that you've been able to do, uh, like if anyone's been to Seattle Airport, um, like the Sub Pop Record Store, <laughs> that's just the most cool as it gets. <laughs> well, I can say that I have never seen vinyl for sale anywhere else, except in the Sub Pop Record Store. Yeah. And Sub Pop turns 30 this year, so you know it's a strong Massive. label that's carried on for 30 <laughs> years. Now, to get to get something like that up and running, is that the commission was responsible for that? Or? It was the commission, and we found an eager partner in the airport, which was great. A music-loving business development person there understood that we could really do something different there. It started with having musicians playing in the airport, it expanded to having videos and the places throughout the airport where people stand around like waiting a baggage check and that kind of thing. Then we expanded to have the announcements made by our famous musicians instead of the regular port people. Say that again. Like the, the overhead announcements, yeah. instead of it being the state airport person saying, don't leave your bag on the sidewalk, it's like, hey, this is back tomorrow. Don't be leaving <laughs> your bag on the sidewalk. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Wow. yeah. And then... I like that idea. I really like that idea. <laughs> and then Sepop stepped in, but really it started out as a vision from the Music Commission, got the port on board, they agreed to support it, and after its first two years, they did a survey of, of tourists, uh, travelers, of how they were liking it, 
and the results were so positive that 94% of the people who they surveyed said they loved it, so the vendors stepped up to support it. So it's no longer just the port, it's a public-private partnership between the vendors in the airport and the Port of Seattle, which runs the airport. That is really cool. <laughs> Did you see something like that in the near future? <laughs> Thank you. Um, wow, okay. How are we doing on time up here? About five minutes. Five minutes. Good. Five minutes. We did good. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yes. Um, So my job is to be very external facing and to be bringing all voices to the table of the city. That said, much more of my time is spent dealing with internal process and trying to help get through the challenges, help our business owners find the success that they're trying to find in the city and, and make their way through navigating our city systems. And I think it's a major, major piece of the role is being that conduit for the industry to come to. Um, so it's a mix, but it really depends on the day. You know, some days it's, I feel like I'm, I'm only in City Hall dealing with City Hall people, and some days I'm completely external with other the projects. Um, but I think it really depends on like, the project. For instance, you know, we're working on like, artist clothing zones right now, and that's exclusively working with different levels of, of uh, city staff. So it's, it really depends on the project. Um, but understanding and knowing who to go to, and I've been really lucky with my bosses. She can, she's helped me navigate that world very much. And it's really about knowing who to go to and sort of their story. And I think knowing their story and how to approach <laughs> how to approach them is, is, a, is a big piece. Because there's some people that I've uh, had to work on some stuff with and I'm told you're not going to get that ever done with that person and because they're this, that, and the other thing. So it's finding that approach and how to go to them. And actually, you know, with this artist loading zone, um, we had some pushback initially because it was very difficult until you found the right person. And then you find the right person, and then they just sort of streamline and move forward. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Sorry, uh, comment. Yeah. Um, Corey, I'm on uh, one of the task forces at Corey at the London uh, City Task Force, and also on uh, the London Music Committee. As a suggestion for people who you want to get involved as musicians on your teams, make sure that you have a nice spread of people who are established and, and either close to retirement or don't uh, are not in the middle of the hustle, plus also having people who are still new and emerging, so you have a fresh perspective from all different strata of the music industry, and make it clear that they, although a commitment is expected, they don't have to show up at every meeting, because quite often they're so busy with their own tour, all they can give you is one hour in and out and take that information. Secondly, uh, we were very successful, um, not only with the patio thing, creating an evidence-based um, result as how to prevent a small, powerful group of people from um, allowing the light to amplify music for the rest of the city to be enjoyed. We were able to create an evidence-based uh, response to that, and that was able to be overturned. But the one thing that I was very proud of as a recording engineer is uh, uh, is to be able to change the bylaw from sound, noise bylaw to sound bylaw because we're not, we're measuring noise, we're measuring sound. Yes. Okay? And so, and the problem with that is, or the challenge that we found is that noise implies a judgment, and we're not, and we should be judgmentless in this area if we're measuring sound. So I'm in the middle of an, of an attempt to try to get this changed. We've changed it at the London level. Now we're going to try to change it at the provincial level because the wording is everything and it's trickled down at that point. So if there's a small leverageable thing that you can do is all these little things that cumulatively create a better environment for musicians. So if you can look at that in your own cities and changing your noise bylaw and finding out how to do that and change it to a sound bylaw of which noise is only a subsection of that, then we can get rid of judgment against music period. Yeah, I think a good, a good A, a, a good uh, way to look at that is noise is a dog park. Noise is not music uh, coming from a patio. Any other question? When you, uh, excuse me? Um, when you uh, mention bringing all the voices to the table, does that include the classical music sector as well? 
because, for instance, in London, Ontario, University of Western, uh, Western Ontario is one of the most uh, respected music schools in the country. So I was wondering, where does the classical music sector come in? I think it definitely fits um, into things. Um, Western's a little tough um, in the sense that they do a lot of stuff on their own, but they are definitely at the table um, when conversations are had. Uh, we like to get their input. Um, we had, when I stepped into my role, um, we had just got funding pulled for our orchestra. And it was the collapse of the orchestra. And I stepped in, and the question was, so how are you saving the orchestra? That was the very first question, right? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> This is interesting, but there's a lot of history there, right? Um, it's definitely a key piece to it. I think when you look at, start looking at like, the film industry, uh, orchestral music is like, the biggest piece of that. Uh, we're now embarking on like a screen-based industries initiative. Where we're trying to support film, television, gaming, and that is a massive piece to it. So I think we're very lucky in London to have an organization like Western, and with all the students that are coming through there, and you know, we have you know, the musician like Steve Knock. Macchiato, um, that have come through those programs and still continue to come back. Um, but I think the key piece to our success in Music City is our students. You know, with 875 students, we have people working in the pop world, we have people working in the classical um, world, and that's really been a major strength of ours. So I view them as a massive ally in what we're trying to do. And in Seattle, we definitely have always been intentional about making sure that the classical music community is represented on our music commission and is at the table. 